chapter 15. We're in a series called Life in the Kingdom, Finding Triumph in Your Test. And we're going to talk this morning about the test of forgiveness. Someone say forgiveness. So I used to think that I was really, really good at asking for forgiveness and admitting that I was wrong, probably like many of you in this room, uh, until I got married. Can anyone relate to that? I actually have to do a uh, warm-ups. Morgan, Morgan will attest to this. In the morning, I wake up, I say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Just to sort of train myself like push-ups. Uh, but really, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just kidding. I kind of had an awareness that, you know, I maybe had a pride issue in my life. I'm not that good at saying I was wrong and asking for forgiveness. Um, I know that's none of you in this room. We have an expert room of forgivers. But uh, I, I remember I was in high school and was just kind of learning how to live in community. And one of my close friends at the time, you know, I was really struggling with admitting that I was wrong and asking for forgiveness. And uh, one of my friends at the time were driving, trying to figure out why am I having so many issues with this. And he looks at me and he's like, I know what your problem is. How many of you laugh when people say that to you? I know what your problem is. You're prideful. And I said to him, no, I'm not. <laughs> and he proceeded to spend the next 45 minutes explaining to me all the ways that he'd seen pride in my life. Until 45 minutes later, I was like, I guess you're right. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? But we're going to look at some stories that uh, Jesus shares in Luke chapter 15 about forgiveness this morning. They're going to be familiar to a few of us in the room. Uh, it's a story uh, of, a, of a shepherd that leaves 99 sheep to go after the one. It's a story of a woman uh, who loses a coin and then finds it. And it's a story of a father who loses a son and then finds him. And we actually had a guest speaker a couple weeks ago, John Harris. How many of you are here for Pastor John when he shared? Uh, he taught an amazing message on Luke chapter 15. And, you know, we at The Rock give our guest speakers a lot of freedom to hear from the Holy Spirit what they're supposed to share on. He shared on Luke 15, as I sat in the front row, checked the message schedule, and confirmed, yes, in two weeks, I also was slated to speak on Luke chapter 15, uh, but talked to the teaching team that we have here and really decided that there must be something that God wants to speak to us as a community to do it back to back. So we're going to look at Luke 15 again this morning, but from a different angle. Um, this morning, we're going to look at it from the lens of community. So say community. And if you look, kind of the climax moment in each of these three stories, each of these three parables is an invitation for celebration in community. Luke uh, chapter 15 verse 6 says, rejoice with me. Say with me. For I have found my sheep that was lost. Luke 15, 9, in the woman with the coin says, rejoice with me. Say with me. For I have found the coin that I had lost. And then the father in Luke 15, 23 and 24 says, let us eat and celebrate. He was lost and was found. So let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you for your presence that was so clear, so evident in worship. God, we thank you for your love for us. God, you love us so much. Um, and Lord, we just pray for an awareness of your love to fill the room. You know, I prayed for this at nine, but I just really feel like um, there's some people in the room, there's an invitation from the Father this morning to reconnect uh, to his love. Like it almost feels like you've been unplugged and God wants to re-plug uh, you into his love. So just with eyes closed, if you've maybe felt disconnected from God's love and kind of feel disconnected from even an awareness of his presence. Just with eyes closed, can you just slip your hand up? I'd love to pray for you. God, we just pray for that reconnection to come this morning. We even speak to emotions in this room. God, we pray for the genuine emotion of your love to fill this room, your peace to come and your stillness to come. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hey, we're going to look at these stories through the lens of community really for a few reasons. And number one is that culturally we're in the middle of what's been called a loneliness epidemic. Uh, and uh, sociologists have labeled it this, psychologists have labeled it this, an article in Psychology Today uh, says that uh, there's 50% more people that identify as lonely uh, than there were even 50 years ago. Uh, one out of every four people identify as chronically lonely. 
I actually do this in youth group a lot. I won't, I won't do it here, but I have uh, the youth students, everyone raises their hand if they've ever experienced loneliness before. And the whole room, it raises their hand, 100% of the room. And then I keep going and say, keep your hands up if you've experienced loneliness this year, this month, this week, today. And without fail, at least 50% of the hands stay up every single time. I mean, this is a real issue for us culturally. Our culture is in desperate need of community. So we're going to read Luke chapter 15 because it's important for the culture. Um, but also we're going to read Luke chapter 15 through the lens of community because uh, it's actually a, a value in the world of the Bible. Uh, Western, as Westerners, we tend to see things, even Pastor Brandon was mentioning it in worship, through the lens of individualism. But in Jewish culture and Greco-Roman culture, people genuinely did uh, view the world not just through what does this mean to me, but what does this mean for me and my family and my village. So it's a biblical value uh, we have to recapture. And also, uh, we've decided we want this to be a value at the Rock of Roseville as a church family. Uh, we've said, hey, we want to be known for identity, mission, and community, uh, for being a family beyond the building, that we don't want our Christianity just to look like church attendance on a Sunday morning, but shared life together at dinner tables and in communities and in parks day by day throughout the week. And so for us, it's a value uh, that we want to engage with as we're reading the Bible. And lastly, we're reading this through the lens of community because it's actually the context of why Jesus shares these parables in the first place. So I've heard, how many of you have ever heard a message on the prodigal son before? I've heard, I, I don't know how many messages in my life, and I, I don't know why, maybe I've just forgotten, but I've never heard someone actually share the context of why Jesus shares this story in the first place. And it's a question from the Pharisees in Luke 15, 1. He says, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. So the, tax, the Pharisees are coming to Jesus saying, why are you spending time with sinners and tax collectors? Why are you choosing these people to be your community? And because they ask him this question about community, Jesus tells them three stories in response. The story of a shepherd who loses a sheep and finds it. The story of a woman who loses a coin and finds it. And the story of a father who loses a son and finds it. One scholar, Jeremiah, says this, says, to understand what Jesus was doing in eating with sinners, it is important to realize that in the East, even today, uh, to invite a man to a meal was an honor. It was an offer of peace, trust, brotherhood, and forgiveness. In short, sharing a table meant sharing life. And so Jesus is inviting these people from the margins of society to his table, and the Pharisees are so offended by it, they're like, how can you spend time with his people? And Jesus answers them by saying this, which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance." So we have to understand just a couple cultural things to help us understand what Jesus is saying. And one of them is this. It's that the Pharisees would have been considered a higher class, uh, perhaps more wealthy, and shepherds would have been considered lower class and less wealthy. Pharisees were not shepherds. And so, Je so the Pharisees say to Jesus, how dare you eat with these sinners, these people lower in society? And Jesus turns right around and says, which of you uh, insulting them by calling them shepherds. Does that make sense? Like that's kind of, I mean, I love what Jesus does. I mean, he's so radically offensive where they're like, how dare you eat with these people? And then he then says, which of you would have a sheep implying that they're kind of lesser also. And it's, it's awesome what Jesus does. So he, he offends them and then he keeps going. And, uh, 
and, 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 he, and, and here's the other thing we have to, we have to understand is that uh, culturally, in no way, shape, or form would one shepherd ever have watched 100 sheep. You know, most of us in the room have probably never tended sheep before. I mean, there's probably some of us, but most of us have never tended sheep. I mean, a hundred sheep is a lot of sheep, okay? And so they would have never had just one shepherd be responsible for a hundred sheep. Uh, there would have been probably one for every ten. And so this shepherd isn't this isolated, solitary shepherd that leaves the 99 sheep to go after the one. He's actually a part of a team of probably 10 or so shepherds. And here's the other reason we know that is because it says he leaves them in the wilderness. And then when he finds the sheep, he comes back home. So somehow the sheep have migrated from the wilderness back to the home. And the implication that people in this day and age would have understood is, oh, my goodness, of course, the team of shepherds that that one shepherd left would have taken those sheep back home. So this is not a picture. We imagine that it's a picture of this one single shepherd that leaves the 99 to go after the one when actually he's a team member that leaves the 99 to go after the one. He's part of a community that's on a mission. And what's more, uh, they would have never hired a shepherd. Uh, it, it wouldn't have been a, like a, someone who's hired. Generally, the shepherds would have been family members. So, so kind of a, a wealthier person would own sheep, but it would give family members the job of watching these sheep. So the shepherds would have been a team of uncles, nephews, brothers. And so we can just imagine this. The shepherd leaves his family members to go off in the wilderness where it's dangerous, where there's wild beasts. The other shepherds come home, and this is a small village. So the small village sees uh, the 99 sheep, but they see nine out of 10 shepherds coming home immediately. Every person in the village would have known who was missing and would, and would have been worried for his safety and well-being. So this shepherd has left his family and his village and his community on a mission to find the one sheep. And when he returns, he returns to a family and a community. And I tell you, they're not just happy the sheep has come home. They're happy that he's come home. So my question for us this morning is, who's the family that's in our life? Who's the community that we return to after we go on mission, whether it's to Haiti or to China or um, all of us are called to be missionaries at our nine to five job? Who's the family that we come back to when it's done to celebrate with? And, you know, uh, we're not just talking here about a, a nuclear family, a mom and a dad and 2.5 kids. Uh, it, we don't have time to go into the history of it, but really the nuclear family of a, of a mom and dad and kids that lived by themselves really wasn't a widespread reality uh, until airplanes were invented and people could leave their families and move away. For most of human history, people have lived in extended families of aunts and uncles and brothers and cousins, and I just can't help but think the Rock of Roseville has a redemptive call to be a people that function not just in our nuclear families, but in these extended families as brothers and sisters in Christ. Who's your family that you celebrate with and come home to? And so the shepherd comes to this sheep in the wilderness. And here you have to notice this order here. Um, he says, when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders and then rejoices. So he rejoices after he lays it on his shoulders. So I don't know about you. I wouldn't rejoice after the sheep is on my shoulders because then I would have to carry it home. Here's why he has to put it on his shoulders because sheep, when they leave the fold and they realize they're not in the fold anymore, they get scared and lie down and won't stand up again until they're back with the sheep. So that's why he couldn't like put it on a leash and walk it home like Fido. Like he had to carry it. Um, and so Fido's like a dog's name. I was trying to make that funny, like a sheep looking like a dog. I just want to make sure we're on the same page there. So, um, so you can't just walk it on like a dog. He has to pick it up. And so I Googled how much sheep weigh. According to Google, it's at minimum 99 pounds, at maximum 350 pounds. 
So question for you, when you find the sheep, would you rejoice before you put it on your shoulders or after you have a 200 pound sheep on your shoulders? For some reason, the shepherd rejoices after. He puts it on, he's prepping for walking this 200 pound sheep back. And here's what one scholar, Kenneth Bailey, calls this. He calls this the joy at the burden of restoration. That he doesn't wait to rejoice until the sheep is restored. He rejoices all the way along in the journey. The joy starts at the moment that process of restoration starts. And there's this joy in the journey as he's carrying the sheep. And then he finally gets home. And there's this joy that the sheep's coming home. I mean, it's a joy-filled process of forgiveness from start to finish. And then Ken Bailey says, once he gets home, there's joy expressed in and shared with community. So I shared this first service with something God is uh, speaking to me personally right now as I'm reading a book on spiritual practices, spiritual practices. How many of you have heard of spiritual practices like fasting and, and prayer and silence and solitude? You know, so I, I'm reading this book expecting basically to feel like, man, I just need to fast more. But I read this book and the first chapter, the first spiritual practice that this author focuses on is the spiritual practice of joy. And he talks about how many of us practice things like anxiety and worry, and we spend time focusing on stress. And he says, as the people of God, we need to spend time practicing things that make us joyful so that when the trial comes, we have a well of joy on the inside of us we can access. Uh, C.S. Lewis actually says my favorite quote. Uh, This is my new favorite quote I decided. He said this. He said, joy is a serious business in the kingdom of heaven. And I would add joy in community is a serious business in the kingdom of heaven on earth. Who's your community and how are you celebrating with them daily? Because we need those wells of joy in community to access as people are welcomed into the family of God. We want to be a joyful people when when they get here. I mean, I'm convinced, I think one of the reasons people don't want to follow Jesus is because if we can be honest, a lot of Christians are really boring people. How many of you are sitting next to someone boring? Just be honest, okay? God is such a joyful God, we have a responsibility to actually practice joy in our life. Joy that's not based on circumstance, but based on the reality of our Savior. So as people are welcomed into the family, they're not just welcome to a service, they're welcome to a celebration. So we actually, we got an opportunity uh, We've been praying, our youth team's been praying and asking God uh, for for open doors on public high schools uh, for forever. And just recently, we had a student come uh, on a Friday night uh, who, she said she'd been coming to the Rocks weekend services for years, had just never come on Friday night. So she comes, uh, encounters God. There's tears. She, She encounters God in a really genuine way. And then we find out that she's actually on the leadership team of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at Antelope High School. And so she encounters God on a Friday night, and she starts to bring her friends to Friday night who all happen to be the leadership team of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at Antelope High School. Uh, So we have six, seven, eight of the leaders of that group at our youth group on Friday nights. Uh, Six of them actually came to camp and encountered God in a powerful way. And some of you guys sponsored them, and I want to thank you for that. But uh, they come, and uh, we've uh, they've invited us to come on their campus. And so we've come on their campus, talked to them, and we've just said, hey, what would it look like? What do you guys want to see on your campus? What do you guys want to see God do? And, we've, and they've kind of said, hey, we don't want to have awesome events. We want to have a community and a family that we can welcome people into. So we said, awesome, let's do it. So Mondays, just practically, what does that look like? So Mondays after school, we all sit around a table. We bring uh, pizza or some other unhealthy food. One week it was uh, Dutch Bros chocolate milk. We bought gallons of Dutch Bros chocolate milk. Does anyone like that? They actually, they'll sell it to you in the gallon if you ask. So we bring them junk food. uh, And then we we go around because there's nothing that builds community with teenagers like pizza and junk food. And then we go around the table and we just share our win 
of the week. And it's this practice and this rhythm of celebrating in community. And this rhythm of celebration, this practice of celebration is so contagious. Every week, we don't advertise this group. We just hang out every week. Uh, students come and want to join in on the fun and community that we're having. Who's your community? And what's the rhythm of celebration you have with your community? So Jesus goes on and says, What woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels over one, sinners, over one sinner who repents. Again, a couple cultural things for us to understand. Number one uh, is this is a, probably a more impoverished uh, culture. Uh, one coin would have had more value than just its monetary value because coins were very rare. So that's why it's a big deal that this coin has gone missing. Um, and then the second thing you might notice is she sweeps the house. Why does she just sweep the house and not search the village? Um, actually, it's because uh, in this society, women uh, were very marginalized and considered as less than men and oftentimes did not have mobility uh, beyond their house. And so that's why she sweeps the house, because she's normally not seen, not heard. Um, she has to stay there. She's viewed as lower. And I mean, just catch what Jesus does. He takes these high-class Pharisees, and number one, compares them to shepherds, but then number two, uh, compares them to women, and actually elevates the woman to be an example of shouldn't you go after lost things and have community like this woman does. It's, it's number one, very offensive to the Pharisees, but number two, very honoring to, the, to women who would have been on the margins of society. Jesus welcomes them right to the middle of his story. My wife's ready to clap. She's like, yes. <laughs> so my question for us is who is on the margins of our lives that we're welcoming into our family and community? Who's the forgotten person, the rejected person, the broken person in our lives? And when's the last time we've had them at our tables for dinner to invite them into those rhythms of celebration? So Jesus keeps going. He says, then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property uh, between them. So there's a scholar named Kenneth Bailey, and what he does is he's, he actually lived in the Middle East, and he devoted his life uh, to understanding the cultural things that are going on, uh, specifically in the Gospels, by studying modern-day people in the Middle East and throughout Asia. And so one of the things he did at one point in his life is he took this parable of the prodigal son, went to villages, uh, which would have had uh, remnants of the culture of Jesus' day, and he read the parable to them and asked them questions um, about it. And this is some of the questions he, he asked. He, say, he, he asked these villagers, has anyone ever made such a request in your village to get their inheritance early? And they answer, never. And he says, could anyone ever make such a request? Impossible. If anyone ever did, what would happen? His father would beat him, of course. Why? Because this request means he wants his father to die. And this is a common understanding in villages, especially in the East, uh, that he, this request means he wants his father to die by asking for the inheritance early. And so what would have happened is, again, through the lens of community, it's not just his relationship with his father that gets broken in this request. He's a part of a village and a community. And so when he wants his father to die, he actually would have been shut off from the entire village. And there's a ceremony that they would do where they would break a pot in the middle of the street to symbolize you are to us broken off like this pot. He would have been rejected from the community forever, and if he ever returned, he would have been stoned. And so I heard, I was telling somebody on Thursday 
uh, that I'm preaching on the prodigal son this weekend, and they said they one time they preached on the prodigal son, and they read the story just to shock the crowd. They read the story and ended it instead of the son receiving restoration, ended it with the son receiving beatings and stonings because that's what would have happened. And I don't want to rush over this just because this is here. Um, you know, there's kind of this thing going on where we talk about we, the, the older son who kind of just remains there and then comes back at the end of the story. What we don't actually realize is the older son is part of this too because he lets it happen. Do you realize this? The, the older son doesn't say no because he's going to get his part of the inheritance too. It's not like the father, you know, gives half the inheritance. He's going to give the older son some inheritance too, meaning the older son gets, is complicit with this other son's request for his father to die to get the inheritance. The older brother is complicit in the sin of the younger brother. And I can't help but think how many times are we complicit when people say negative things about God and our culture, or negative things about the Father? I mean, this is what the older brother is doing. He's complicit in this sin. They're, they're both breaking relationship with their father and with their community. And so the, the older son in verse 13, uh, it, it says, He gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly filled himself with the pods the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. So there's uh, another scholar uh, named Mark Allen Powell who took the prodigal son and read it with seminary students all across America and then all across uh, Russia and Europe and some other countries. And uh, he, he read the story with them. And I, I did the same thing just to kind of see if I'd get the same results that he got with some of my students at Jessup. And it's the same thing. Across the board, 94% of Americans who read the story of the prodigal son leave out the word famine when they have to recount the major events of the story. So you do this exercise, you read the prodigal son, they have to list the major events. 94% of Americans leave out the word famine. When he does this with Russians in Russia, uh, a majority in the 90th percentile count famine as a major event in the story. And why is that? Uh, it's because in Russia, there was a major starvation event after World War II where over a quarter of the population died. So for Russian students reading the story, famine is seared on their national conscience where they had grandparents, uh, great aunts, great uncles die in this famine. So when they read this, it's a big deal to them. But for us Americans, most of us have never, you know, those of us in here who are Americans, we, most of us have never experienced a famine and so this aspect of this story just kind of goes right over our heads. Isn't that interesting? And so that, that kind of helps us to see, man, man we got to put some cultural glasses on here. Here's the other thing that's going on is, uh, is the son is leaving his family and his village. He's leaving his community and then going into isolation, something that's very shocking for this culture. Do you know what Americans said the number one problem in the story was? Americans said the number one problem in the story, in this survey, Mark Allen Powell did, they said the number one problem was that the son wasted dad's money. Isn't that so American? The son <laughs> wasted dad's money. He sinned. He messed up. When you read this story in Eastern cultures, they'll identify the pri some of the primary problems in Tanzania. They'll identify the primary problem is that no one in the foreign land welcomed him and they left him alone. For many Eastern countries, the primary problem isn't in this parable isn't the waste of resources. It's something to do with the shame of him leaving community and going off by himself and being left alone. And it's when he leaves the community and goes off by himself and left alone, that's when he experiences famine. For many of us, when we leave our community and go off on our own, isn't that when the famines of life start to come? 
And really what community is and what's kind of the subtext of this parable is it really is like the insurance policy for when the fire comes is many of us are so good at celebrating in community when things are good. But as soon as things get hard, we isolate and don't share with community anymore. And then we were confused when we can't make it through the trial. And we get stuck. Uh, Community is like the fire insurance that when the fire comes, we're going to be able to make it through because we have family around us. So who's your community? What's your rhythm of celebration? And what is that rhythm that's going to keep you through even in the time of trial? Verse 17 says, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. He basically realizes how hungry he is, which again, I think it's so funny that most Americans don't notice that whole element, the famine in the story. He says, I'll get up and go to my father and I'll say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. Has anyone ever practiced a repentance speech to their spouse, to someone you practice in your head? I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. That's what he's doing. He's practicing. He's like, I'm going to say this and this, and I I hope he forgives me. So he practices the speech, goes in, and verse 20, it says, so he went off and went to his father. And here's the climax. Here it is. While he was still far off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him. And kissed him. And once again, we imagine this father, I don't know, sitting in his living room, looking out the window wistfully, and then he sees his son on the horizon. Here's the reality is again, this is a village. This is a farming village. Everyone would have been out in the fields working, uh, you know, women in the marketplace, you know, everyone's out. Everyone would have seen him coming. And they had the right, based on that ceremony of breaking the pot, to stone him as soon as they saw him. And what's more than likely going because of the deep offense in this culture of violating community, what's more than likely going on is the village is starting to form the mob getting ready to stone the son. And what the father does is he picks up his robes, which is a very shameful thing for men to do in that culture, and he runs to beat the mob and forgive his son. The father risks the rejection of his community in order to extend forgiveness to his son. The father risks humiliation and vulnerability so that his son can be honored. Ken Bailey says it this way. He says, uh, the father comes down out of the house and in a dramatic act uh, demonstrates unexpected love publicly in humiliation. Do we know that this is what the Father does for us? He, he, he was rejected so that we can be accepted. He was humiliated so that we could be honored. And the Father forgives the Son by hugging him, kissing him, and that one act of forgiveness then has a ripple effect through the whole community, and the whole community forgives him as well. The father's forgiveness doesn't stop with the son, but extends to the whole community. So that's kind of the last, the last point here this morning. It, we're, we're just, I'll just summarize the rest for time's sake. You know, the older son ends up having his moment of forgiveness also, but that one act of the father's public humiliation started this ripple effect of forgiveness that extends throughout the whole community. The father's forgiveness starts with us, but it never ends with us. The father's forgiveness is a stream and a river, not a pond. And when the father forgives us, we have the opportunity to extend that forgiveness to everyone else as well.